Hello and welcome back. Let's continue with our lesson for Chapter 9, Reproduction and Development. Once again, I'm Miss Delia and let's continue with our lesson. As you know, we are in subtopic 9.3, Fertilization and Fetal Development. And in this video, we're continuing with the second segment, which is on fetal development. Or in other words, how the baby grows inside the mother's womb. Now, here are the learning outcomes for this subtopic. I hope that by the end of the lesson, you would be able to define embryogenesis, state the developmental stages from zygote to the formation of morula, blastocyst, and gastrula through cleavage. You should also be able to define organogenesis and state the organ formed from each germ layer during organogenesis. Now, if you're ready, let's begin. So first things first, we should start with definitions. Let us define what is embryogenesis. Embryogenesis is the process by which the embryo will form and develop. So how it goes from one single cell, divides by mitosis, it develops into different organs, and eventually becomes a fetus, and when it comes out, we call it a baby. Now, when we talk about children forming in the womb, this applies to not only humans, but also other animals, there is a pregnancy period or what is called a gestation period. Okay, waktu mengandung boleh juga digelar sebagai waktu gestasi. So in humans, we can say it is roughly 10 months. Kalau yang ideal, uh, perempuan mengandung untuk manusia adalah dia kandung selama 10 bulan ataupun 40 minggu, kadang 41 minggu, kadang 42 minggu. Dan 10 bulan itu dibahagi kepada tiga trimester. It's divided into three trimesters as you see over here. From the point of conception, that is week one, and birth is the final week. Now, when it is in the womb, you can call it baby. But actually, when it comes to more scientific terms, we refer to it as an embryo in roughly the first trimester. And after this, the first trimester, second and third trimester, we start calling it a fetus. In human pregnancies, a baby-to-be is not considered a fetus until the ninth week after conception or week 11 after your last menstrual period. Dalam erti kata lain, yang hijau itu sejak, yang kita gelar dia sebagai embryo, selepas itu baru boleh gelar sebagai fetus. The embryonic period, which is the one in green, is all about the formation of important systems of the body. Think of it as the baby's basic foundation and framework being built in the womb. So here it will start developing all its important circulatory systems, neural systems, and everything. The fetal period, the one in red, is more about growth and development so your baby is ready to survive in the outside world. Dalam mati kata lain, organ-organ segala-gala benda penting terbentuk waktu yang hijau tu, embryo. Dan bila dia jadi fetus, yang merah tu, dia tinggal membesar sahaja. Okay, so that's a nice tidbit of information. And this diagram is also illustrating the same concept. It's talking about how cells can grow from one cell, zygote, embryogenesis, through cleavage formation, gastrulation, and organogenesis until it becomes a fully grown baby. So now you know what is embryogenesis. You should also know that there are three stages in embryogenesis, which is cleavage stage, gastrulation stage, and organogenesis stage. And you can also see here what we call that developing embryo at each of the stage. Pada stage ini kita panggilnya apa? Stage ini kita panggilnya apa? And now let's learn about each of those stages. Okay, so the stages can be summed up in this diagram. As you can see here, we show it from ovulation to fertilization to cleavage to implantation and later on as the implantation of blastocyst continues. We'll first talk about the cleavage stage, first stage in embryogenesis. This is the stage where there is continuous rapid mitotic division at the oviduct or the fallopian tube. It is the development, 
from zygote into blastocyst. So ini selepas persenyawaan, masih di fallopian tube sebab persenyawaan berlaku dalam fallopian tube. Dia akan mitosis secara mendadak. Daripada zygote, dia develop jadi blastocyst. And in this process, it will increase the cell number, but the size of the cells do not increase. There is no growth period for the cells before they enter into mitosis. Each of the cells in this stage will be called a blastomere. Initially, the zygote will divide, forming a two-celled embryo. So they're starting a two-celled embryo. And then repeated division forms four cells and then continue dividing, forming 32 cells. So bila dia dua sel, dia masih digelar embryo, empat sel punya embryo, lima, uh, empat, enam belas sel punya embryo. Bila dia sampai 32 sel, kita gelar dia sebagai morula. A morula is a solid ball of blastomeres. And this solid ball of blastomeres is still surrounded by the zona pellucida. Ingat zona pellucida yang kita belajar dalam subtopik sebelum ni. Zona pellucida itu masih tidak tertanggal, dia masih melindungi blastomeres. And it will float in the uterus for several days and are nourished by endometrial secretion. Sekarang dia masih terapung-apung dalam rahim dan diberikan zat ataupun nutrisi daripada endometrial secretion. Means dinding rahim tu sedang mengeluarkan zat-zat yang di, diperlukan oleh embryo. Okay, so this is a diagram showing what I explained just now. From 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32. And then we are going to continue with what happens to the embryo. The cells will continue dividing and forming 64 to several hundreds of blastomeres, forming a blastula or blastocyst. Maksud ayat ini, bila dia sampai 64 sel ataupun lebih daripada 64 sel, dia akan start untuk membentuk blastula ataupun blastocyst. Which is, daripada dia solid begitu, sekarang dia jadi bentuk macam ini. Ada ruang kosong di dalam. A blastocyst is a sphere of cells with fluid-filled space. Okay? Dia begini, dia macam bulat. Dalam ada satu kawasan yang ada banyak sel padat, ada satu kawasan yang kosong. Kawasan yang kosong, that cavity, is filled with fluids. Okay, ada cecair di dalam. Cecair itu digelar sebagai blastocell. At this point, when it forms a blastula or a blastocyst, the zona pellucida that was outside is now going to shed. Okay. Pada tahap ini, baru itu zona pelusida terbuka. And it is now ready to implant to endometrium. About one week after fertilization is the time when this blastocyst will start to implant to the wall of the uterus called the endometrium. Okay, so once again, we are here. We started with fertilization and then cleavage. Once it gets here, it's near the endometrium already. It's called a morula, goes down, further develops into early blastocyst, and later it's going to go into implantation. After the blastocyst reaches the uterus, the blastomeres will differentiate into an inner cell mass where you have a cluster of cell at one end of the blastocyst, right here, which is this part colored in yellow and the tropoblast, which is the outer epithelium of the blastocyst. Okay, lapisan luar, tropoblast, and that is the one colored in purple. So once again, this is a diagram showing how you go from zygote, two cell, four cell, eight cell, morula, early blastocyst, and late blastocyst. Early blastocyst, itu zona pellucida, baru mau tanggal-tanggal. Late blastocyst, tertanggal sudah itu zona pellucida. The size of the blastomeres will become smaller due to cleavage. Nama dia cleavage sebab dia merujuk kepada cleavage poro yang balik-balik terbentuk 
pada setiap stage mitosis dan cytokinesis. Now we talk about implantation. Ataupun uh, kalau kita cakap secara kasar, uh, dia adalah proses di mana embryo itu melekat kepada dinding rahim. Implanted into the endometrium. The embryo implantation is initiated by the tropoblast. Tropoblast yang mulakan proses implantation. This tropoblast, which is, remember, it's the outer layer of the blastocyst. It will secrete enzymes to break down the molecules of endometrium, which is the lining of uterus. Dia akan pergi dekat kepada dinding rahim, lepas tu dia akan keluarkan enzim untuk memeleraikan, menguraikan molekul dinding rahim. Once those enzymes break down the molecules of the endometrium, it will allow the invasion by the blastocyst. Okay, so begini dia akan melekat dan dia akan start kasi keluar dia punya enzim-enzim. The trophoblast at the same time will also extend finger-like projections forming trophoblastic villi. Means lepas dia sudah kasi keluar enzim dia, dia semakin masuk ke dalam isi endometrium. Pada masa yang sama dia akan tumbuh sel. Okay, it's going to grow its tissue until the tissue looks like finger, 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 finger-like projection. Yang si, uh, tissue yang dia sedang kasih panjang begitu, tu, itu digelar sebagai tropoplastic villi. This tropoplastic villi will cause capillaries in the endometrium to spill out blood that can be captured by the tropoblast tissue. So, bila ada begini, Saluran darah yang di sini, dia akan keluarkan darah dia supaya zat-zat dalam darah boleh diserap oleh tropoblast tissue. This exchange of nutrients, oxygen and excretory waste will occur between the blastocyst and the tropoblastic villi. Jadi melalui tropoblastic villi ini, okay, uh, the blastocyst is going to get nutrients oxygen from the mother and then excrete waste such as carbon dioxide and etc to the maternal blood vessels. Okay, so ini adalah proses dia daripada dia baru melekat dan lepas 2-3 hari dia akan semakin terbenam semakin ini yang kita katakan um, itu embryo berjaya melekat kepada dinding rahim dia akan nampak macam begini. Continuing on, the inner cell mass will form a flat disk with an inner layer of cells, the epiblast, and an outer layer, the hypoblast. So, apa yang berlaku di dalam, okay, cell di dalam tu, the inner cell mass, dia akan start bentuk satu disk, macam disk yang leper. Okay, so that part of the cell, satu bahagian digelar sebagai epiblast, satu bahagian digelar sebagai hypoblast. The inner cell mass will finally develop into embryo and extra embryonic membrane. Di stage ini dia akan membentuk embryo dan extra embryonic membrane. Extra embryonic membranes are things like amnion, yolk sac, and Allen toys. Okay, so this is what it looks like at day 11. Now we enter into the third stage of embryogenesis, which is gastrulation. Our cells go from blastocyst and eventually become gastrula. As implantation is completed, gastrulation stage will begin. Gastrulation is the formation of three germ cells from blastocyst into gastrula. The inner cell mass will be differentiated into three embryonic germ layers, which are the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So, dalam arti kata lain, apa yang berlaku adalah tisu-tisu sel-sel di dalam Embryo ini, sekarang embryo ini bukan digelar blastosis, sudah dia digelar sebagai gastrula. Dia akan susun, dia akan ada susunan dia. Dan mereka akan dipisahkan, dibezakan kepada tiga embryonic germ layers. Iaitu ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Now you may have associated the word germ with just kuman. Okay, perkataan germ ini bukan sahaja merujuk kepada kuman. Tapi dia juga merujuk kepada 
sejenis sel yang boleh dikira sebagai uh, jenis sel asas, dia boleh berubah menjadi sel jenis lain. Germ cells or germ tissue are cells that are unspecialized and they can become other types of cells. Nanti kamu akan tengok ectoderm ini lama-kelamaan dia akan berubah menjadi organ lain. Mesoderm ini lama-kelamaan dia berubah menjadi organ lain. Endoderm sekarang dia nampak macam sama sejak dengan dua lagi tu. Tapi lama-kelamaan dia akan jadi macam organ lain. Okay. So that is for later. We're going to look at that later. Uh, for now, I need to mention that the gastrula is surrounded by four extra embryonic membrane, which are the chorion, amnion, allantois, and the yolk sac. Sekarang kita tidak payah fokus sangat. Sekadar kamu tahu, okay, yang orang itu chorion, uh, lebih kurang di sini amnion, lebih kurang di sini allantois, lebih kurang di sini yolk sac. We're going to learn more about them later. This is a diagram showing how gastrulation occurs. Okay, mula-mula tadi kita cakap itu tisu dia tersusun begitu, rata saja. Macam mana dia boleh terlipat dan menjadi tiga germ layer itu? Itu yang diagram ini cuba untuk tunjukkan. Okay, so it started with this first image, then the second image, then the third and the fourth. Do you need to memorize this? No, tapi ini cukup sekadar berikan kamu gambaran. Okay, once again, this is a diagram showing you how it goes from tropoblast into this one, a blastula, and then eventually into this gastrula. Gastrula, gastrula, gastrula. Okay. During the gastrula stage is when we can have the organogenesis. Okay, kita akan start pembentukan organ. Organogenesis definition is it is the process of organ formation. And it arises from the three germ layers that we talked about earlier. Morphogenesis and cell differentiation will continue to refine the organ. Morphogenesis means the animal body takes shape occur over the last two stages of the embryonic development. Pembentukan bentuk. Morpho, bentuk. Genesis, proses ataupun proses pembentukan. Okay, so this is what I was talking about earlier. So those three germ layers will grow and differentiate and become all these different types of tissues. Ectoderm adalah germ cell yang lama kelamaan dia akan membentuk nervous system, sensory organ, outer layer of skin and nails and hair, and also the pituitary gland that is inside your head. The mesoderm will eventually become the notochord, which is kira macam kamu punya, uh, it's something that is near your spine, berdekatan dengan tulang belakang kamu. Your skeleton, your tulang-tulang, your muscle, your circulatory system, your excretory system, your reproductive system, and your inner layer of skin. Basically, everything isi-isi inside of you comes from mesoderm. And lastly, endoderm will eventually form the lining of your digestive tube and the lining of your respiratory system. So, lapisan yang di dalam, from your mouth all the way to your butthole, that comes from your endoderm. What is the layer of tissue inside your lungs, inside your nose? Those came from endoderm. Okay, so once again, a diagram showing how the Ectoderm becomes external layer, mesoderm becomes the middle layer that becomes all your easy, easy, and endoderm is the internal layer that becomes these linings of your GI tract and lining of your respiratory tract. Okay, so this part is talking about the extra embryonic membrane and its function. 
to be honest, this part is more or less out of your syllabus already. Sepatutnya sepatutnya tidak termasuk dalam syllabus sudah. Tapi kami sertakan sahaja di dalam nota mana tahu kamu mau belajar dan mana tahu terkeluar. So we're just teaching it to you as extra information. I hope you can gain something from it. But if it's too much for you to memorize, don't stress too much about it. Okay, so what is extra embryonic membrane? Extra embryonic membrane are the tissues that are produced by the embryo for the protection and nutrition. Nama dia extra embryonic membrane means dia di luar embryo. So it is not part of the embryo and they are discarded at birth. There are four types of extra embryonic membrane as I've mentioned before, which is the chorion, the amnion, the yolk sac, and the allantois. In this image, you cannot see clearly where is the chorion, where is the yolk sac, where is the allantois. But in this diagram, you can see. So the chorion is the layer outside. The amnion is this purple layer. Itu embryonic head kepala kamu lah. Okay. The allantois is this little extension here. And the yolk sac is this yolk, <laughs> this round thing in the middle. Okay, so yolk sac is lined with endoderm, amnion is here, forion is like blah, 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 blah. And now you can see the extra embryonic membrane in relation to the structure of the placenta and the mother's blood vessels. Dari pada chorion, itu dikira sebagai placenta. Okay, so here you can see this is your umbilical cord. Inilah kamu punya tali pusat yang bersambung kepada plasenta dalam rahim. Alright, so uh, we're just going to go through each of these extra embryonic membranes. The first of the extra embryonic membranes that we're going to talk about is the chorion. Chorion developed from the tropoblast. It is the outermost membrane that surrounds the embryo and other membranes completely. They have finger-like projection which grow into the endometrium called chorionic villi. The function of the chorion is to facilitate in the formation of placenta. Chorion akan membantu dalam proses pembentukan placenta. It will enable gaseous exchange, nutrients, and metabolic waste. At the same time, it also produces HCG hormone. Human chorionic, human chorion gonadotropin hormone, if I'm not mistaken. Then you have the amnion, the second extra embryonic membrane. The amnion developed from the ectoderm and the mesoderm together. It is filled with amniotic fluid in which it is initially derived from maternal blood. Okay, ini adalah air ketuban na tu. Uh, the water, the fluid that is inside the placenta that you swim around in when you were a fetus. So this fluid... Initially, it came from maternal blood, but in the later fetal development, the fetal urine will maintain its volume. Pada asalnya, cecair dalam amnion ini berasal daripada darah ibu, tapi lama-kelamaan, uh, fetus itu pun akan kencing, dan kencing daripada fetus akan menyebabkan volume cecair dalam amnion tidak berubah. The amnion will contain lots of protein, carbohydrates, fats, enzymes, hormones, and also excretion from the baby. The function of the amnion is to enclose and protect the embryo against physical trauma. It is there to suspend the embryo in a shock-free environment and to maintain stable temperature. It also prevents embryonic parts from adhering and fusing together. It allows also the free movement of the embryo. Dalam, uh, kalau kita cakap secara ringkas lah, dia untuk melindungi bayi atau melindungi kandungan. Um, protect from physical trauma, shock-free, stable temperature. Also prevents your part, body parts from fusing together. 
and allows the fetus to move inside of the womb. Next, we talk about the third extra embryonic membrane, which is the Allen toys. The Allen toys is developed from the endoderm and mesoderm. So dia, berala, dia berasal daripada tisu yang tersepit di antara endoderm dan mesoderm. Fungsi Allen toys, function of the Allen toys is as a structural base for the umbilical cord. Okay, dia sebagai uh, base untuk melekat untuk umbilical cord. Tadi pusat. It will contain blood vessels which develop into blood vessels of umbilical cord. Mula-mula dia sendiri mengandungi saluran darah yang lama-kelamaan akan membentuk saluran darah dalam tali pusat. It will transport oxygen and nutrients from the placenta to the embryo and also excrete nitrogenous waste and CO2 from the embryo. And later, this Allen toys will become part of your urinary bladder. The fourth extra embryonic membrane that we're going to talk about is the yolk sac. The yolk sac develop, developed from endoderm and the mesoderm. It will enclose a fluid-filled space which contains no yolk. In humans, no yolk. In other animals, yes yolk. If Function of the yolk sac is it will eventually form part of your gut. Okay, it eventually forms our digestive tube and it produces the earliest blood vessels and blood cells for the embryo. So when you're an embryo, the yolk sac is what will produce your blood cells and your blood vessels. Last but not least, we are talking about what supplies you with most of your needs, what you probably heard about before, which is the placenta. The placenta is a disc-shaped organ. It is linked to the embryo via an umbilical cord, and it will contain two portions. The first portion is the fetal portion that is derived from chorion, and the maternal portion, which is derived from the endometrial wall. Okay, so this is what a cross section of the placenta look like. You have the fetal portion, which is the one part of the baby, and the maternal portion, which is part of the mother. Here you have the umbilical arteries or umbilical vein that contains, uh, that is contained in the umbilical cord and connects to the embryo. Up here you see the maternal arteries and the maternal veins, which supply all the nutrients down here. The function of placenta is as an endocrine organ, which is organ that produces hormone, secreting estrogen and progesterone. Placenta also act as a barrier to separate the maternal and fetal circulation. Dia berfungsi untuk memisahkan pengaliran darah antara ibu dengan anak. Why is it necessary to have this barrier? We need this barrier to prevent the mixing of blood groups, number one. So you can think of yourself. What happens if you have a mother with blood type A and a child with blood type B? If there is no mixing of blood groups, what happens? If there is accidental mixing of blood group between the mother and the child, what happens to both of them? So that is the first reason why placenta is there to separate maternal and fetal circulation. Second reason why placenta needs to function as a barrier is to prevent high maternal blood pressure from destroying the delicate fetal blood vessel. So jangan lupa, ibu ni dia sudah dewasa. Dalam saluran darah dia, pressure ataupun tekanan darah itu lebih tinggi daripada tekanan darah dalam Saluran darah baby. Dan saluran darah baby juga belum cukup matang. But it's not fully developed. So it cannot withstand the high pressure. Third function of placenta is to allow exchange of materials between fetal capillary bed and maternal blood pools. So fetal capillary bed adalah di sini. Maternal blood pool adalah yang warna-warna di belakang itu. 
Okay. So what happens there? Nutrients such as water, vitamins, and glucose and oxygen are exchanged to the fetus. The fetus will excrete metabolic waste such as urea, bilirubic acid, uric acid, and CO2 from fetus and give that to the placenta. Antibodies, which function for passive immunity and hormones, will diffuse from the maternal blood into the fetal blood. So, ada hormon dengan antibody dari ibu ke anak melalui placenta. And this is not really a good function, but this is possible to happen. Harmful substances such as drugs, alcohol, and infectious agents may cross the placenta to the fetus. Uh, ini bukan fungsi utama kenapa kita ada placenta, tapi ini adalah benda yang boleh berlaku kalau kita mengandung. Which is why, if you're pregnant, you are told not to take any drugs, not to drink any alcohol, and not to smoke during pregnancy. Because you don't want the harmful substances to cross over to your fetus through your placenta. At the same time, the placenta also produces another hormone called HCG. So that is fourth function of placenta. So just now I gave a very long lesson. I started with how embryogenesis begins and the three stages that are involved in embryogenesis. I also talk about what is organogenesis and what are the extra embryonic membranes and also the placenta. I hope that you're able to remember a little bit about placenta stuff, but I'm going to give you a really quick summary of the main points of this subtopic. Okay, so ini adalah rumusan main point, main point, main point untuk subtopic ini. Yang selebihnya, bagus kalau kamu ingat, tapi kalau terlupa-lupa pun, it's okay. Okay, so first things first, remember the definition for embryogenesis, which is a process by which the embryo forms and develops. Embryogenesis is divided into three stages, cleavage, gastrulation, and organogenesis. Organogenesis is defined as the process of organ formation. And please remember what each of the germ layers will eventually develop into. So those are the main points of this subtopic. I also have this very nice video from National Geographic, which shows the time lapse of a single cell of salamander embryo or a salamander zygote slowly developing, going through the stages of embryogenesis and eventually becomes a salamander. Although this is not a mammal, okay, we are mammals, salamander is a type of amphibian but the process is more or less visually similar. We don't have any videos of human embryos developing like this because they need to develop in the womb, uh, which is why we only have examples of salamanders, amphibian eggs. That's our video example. So have a look, go to the link later and really enjoy it yourself. Try to see if you can identify the three stages of embryogenesis in this video. Cuba tengok, cuba kalau kamu boleh cari tiga stage itu sendiri. Okay. So that is the end of my lesson. What should you do now? Please make your own notes for this subtopic and try to answer the tutorial questions, part B, questions two and three. I will share with you the answers later and I hope that you're able to understand something from these lessons. Thank you very much for your time and attention and I will see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye.